Well, thank you for coming. Um, it's a very uh, proud moment for, for me as Executive Director of the Menzies Research Centre. This is the first publication that, that we put out since I, I took over the role in July. Uh, a think tank uh, is about ideas and it's about promoting ideas and for all the uh, excitement and, and, and uh, benefit you can get from the internet and from Facebook and everything else we use today, there's nothing that beats a, a, a hard copy publication uh, with good empirical useful uh, data in it that you can use uh, to push good ideas to get good policy in action. So that was the thinking behind this series, the R.G. Menzies essay. Uh, and I'd first of all like to say how privileged we are to have Heather Henderson with us here um, and uh, so that we can, uh, we can um, have her with us and give us <coughs> Menzies' blessing, I guess, on this project uh, and, and hope that this in some way uh, it carries on the great tradition of, of ideas, of liberal ideas uh, that... that uh, Robert Menzies uh, started uh, and made concrete with the formation of the Australian uh, Liberal Party, or the Liberal Party of Australia, and then, of course, with that long period of government which, which built modern Australia, as we know from a recent book. Um, but uh, the, the Menzies essay series was, is an idea that we had to, to get ideas out there, to present a forum for ideas, not necessarily that people have to agree with, but uh, uh, they will, we hope, contribute to the public debate. Uh, in, in a positive way uh, from the centre uh, of Australian life from the Australian centre of Australian politics the place that Menzies held for so long uh, because while there's so much commentary out there so much talk and chatter it seems to me what we're crying out for is, are voices from the sensible centre and that's what we'll be presenting in the RG Menzies essay series as it continues um, I'm very proud to say that uh, Slightly embarrassed, perhaps, to say that in a series which is there to promote the future of Australia, the advance of Australia, the progress of Australia, we have to turn to New Zealand for our first <laughs> issue. Uh, but uh, many people have observed, I think, especially since the election of John Key for a third time uh, in August, that uh, something's happening in New Zealand for the last six years that hasn't been happening here. While we had uh, two terms of Labour government obsessed with, 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 with personalities, obsessed with the, the periphery, of the, the frippery of politics, the photo opportunity, the press release. Uh, in New Zealand, they've quietly been getting on with some serious reform uh, and in the process equipping New Zealand for this, as we like to call it, Asian century. Um, Oliver Hartwich uh, is a man who is probably one of the best authorities on this, uh, Oliver brings a global perspective to this region and to New Zealand. Uh, Oliver started out his, his, uh, his life uh, as a staffer in the House of Commons in London. Lords. Uh, sorry? House of Lords. House of Lords, even better, even better. Uh, Senator, with respect. Um, and, then, and then went on to join the, the, the policy exchange think tank, uh, where he worked with uh, helping David Cameron in opposition with some ideas, some of which I think Cameron accepted, some of which he pushed to one side, but uh, that's by the by. He then came to Australia and, and worked for the CIS, which is where I and many others of us got to know him, doing some really solid work there, uh, putting the Australian story in the global context, and particularly his analysis where he was comparing Australia with Europe was very sharp and very important uh, at that time. Uh, he then went on to New Zealand to head the New Zealand Initiative, uh, which is uh, from where he's come with, with great authority uh, and great perspective to talk to us about the, uh, the reforms that the key government, the key National Party government has carried out, uh, where New Zealand's heading, and perhaps, dare I say it, uh, in uh, Minister Cormann's presence, uh, there are some lessons there for Australia too. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Oliver to, uh, sorry, the Minister first and then Oliver. Uh, to, to say a few words. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Nick. It's a great uh, privilege for me to be uh, launching uh, this first uh, Menzies uh, essay uh, here today, Quiet Achievers, the New Zealand Path uh, to Reform, in particular in the presence uh, of Heather 
uh, Henderson, uh, and also uh, my good friend uh, Senator Bob Day uh, and uh, the uh, High Commissioner uh, for uh, New Zealand, uh, Chris Seed. Uh, now, <clears throat> the most important uh, lesson out of this book, in my view, uh, is uh, that if you want to know where you're headed, or if, you if we want to know as a country where we're headed, the most important uh, thing uh, is to look at the trajectory we're on. The trajectory we're on is way more important than the starting position. Uh, and uh, what I would uh, refer you to uh, there is, uh, in particular, when you read the book, there's a graph on uh, page 34, which uh, shows uh, very clearly uh, that back in 2007, 2008, after uh, nearly 12 years of uh, strong coalition government, uh, the Australian economy was stronger uh, than the New Zealand economy. We went uh, into the global financial crisis here in Australia in a stronger uh, position in terms of uh, our budget, in terms of our economy, uh, than New Zealand. But if you look at what has happened in New Zealand since uh, the global financial crisis, on the back of the reform agenda pursued by the key uh, government, uh, they have been able to get themselves into a better position uh, than we did uh, here in Australia. And I thought that Nick was being uh, quite benign in the way he described the actions of the previous government, if uh, personality fights and press releases uh, was the only uh, thing that they had done in their six-year uh, period in government, we might have uh, got away uh, more uh, easily in terms of the impact uh, on uh, our quality of life, the strength of our economy and living standards and the like. The problem is uh, that unlike uh, other uh, governments around the world, unlike the uh, government in New Zealand, which focused on uh, New Zealand's international competitiveness, which focused on uh, reducing the cost of doing business uh, in Australia, in, uh, in New Zealand, uh, here in Australia we had a government that kept putting more and more lead uh, into our saddleback uh, arguably at the worst possible time. I mean, when we talk about repeal of the carbon tax, repeal of the mining tax, uh, getting rid of uh, unnecessary uh, red tape to reduce the cost of doing business uh, in Australia, these are not ideological pursuits. These are not things that we are doing uh, out of, uh, you know, because it was a political campaign slogan. These are things that we're doing uh, because we think it is so important to put Australia back on a stronger trajectory for the future, a trajectory where we're more competitive internationally, where we can grow uh, the economy uh, more strongly, where everyone has the opportunity to get ahead, uh, and, uh, and of course where uh, ultimately um, we, we are able to grow jobs again uh, for, for people across Australia. When we came into government in September uh, last year, we inherited a weakening economy, rising unemployment, a low consumer and business confidence, and a budget uh, in very bad shape. Now we are one, one year in. A bit over a year in, and there's still a lot of uh, more work to do. But if, if you if you look at the foundations that we've been able to uh, put in place over the last 12 months, we believe that we are on a similar uh, trajectory to the one that has been pursued uh, in New Zealand now over six years. And uh, and of course the opportunity for us is that in five years from now we'll be able to look back uh, on uh, similar. Uh, achievements, and then maybe in five years from now in New Zealand somebody will write a book about the Australian experience and how uh, people in New Zealand can learn from us. But, I mean, j just to sort of dwell for a moment on, on that point in relation to the trajectory uh, before launching, launching the book um, formally. Here in Australia we know that this is true too, right, because we have been on a different trajectory in the past uh, too. Back in 1996, uh, the coalition government then uh, inherited a situation where the budget was in need of repair, where there was a need for economic reform. Uh, and after a serious effort to repair the budget, after a serious effort to initiate economic reform, we gave ourselves the space to pursue tax reform, uh, which in itself continued uh, to give us the opportunity to build a stronger, more prosperous economy. And we ended up in this virtuous cycle that New Zealand is in now. Uh, our objective with what we're trying to do here in Australia now is to get ourselves back into that virtuous uh, cycle where in four or five or six years time uh, we can uh, look back and say okay how did we get here from that really challenging position back in 2012-2013. Uh, New Zealand is five years further down the track than we are because they've had uh, five more years of good government. Uh, after uh, five more years of good government here in Australia, hopefully we'll be able to uh, demonstrate uh, that uh, it, it is ultimately uh, the trajectory that we're on that is going to determine whether we'll be able to uh, improve our living standards, improve opportunity into the future instead of detracting from it, as uh, sadly uh, happened uh, over the previous six years. So without any further ado, thank you so much again for inviting me to launch this. This is a very important uh, contribution 
uh, to the public policy debate uh, here in Australia. I commend it uh, to you. Uh, and uh, hopefully in five years from now uh, we'll be able to have a conversation on how the Abbott government uh, have been the uh, quiet achievers uh, and have taken Australia on a strong path to reform that has uh, led to increases in living standards and improved opportunity for all. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, now without further ado I'll introduce Oliver uh, to talk briefly about his own book. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Minister, for your kind words about the publication. I think there's something we share. We both arrived in Australia as migrants from Europe, and uh, I think you had a very similar experience that I had. I really enjoyed the Australian bus that came out of the great reform period of the 1980s and 90s, and I compared that back to Europe. And I often reported back to my European friends. I wrote for European newspapers and said, you should look at Australia. This is what reforms can do, and this is what you can achieve if you go about them. Then I worked here, and I must say, I, I think it's probably another thing that we share, the frustration of the last few years before you took over of how this great reform experience ended, how we experienced a reform holiday, and how suddenly we seem to be going into reverse. And especially for the last few years that I lived in Australia, it felt more like a traditional European experience at times, but that's not why I had migrated. So I was getting increasingly frustrated before I left for New Zealand when I got um, my job offer there in 2012. But it was actually quite a strange choice for someone who really believes in reforms to move to New Zealand at that time, at least, um, because I was swimming against the current. At that time, there were about 40,000 Kiwis every year leaving New Zealand for a supposedly better life across the ditch here. And when I arrived in New Zealand, um, I had to explain my choice more than once to Kiwis who asked me, why would anyone in his right mind leave Australia for New Zealand and Sydney for Wellington? Um, not even talking about the weather here. But the narrative has changed a lot in the last couple of years. And what I realize increasingly is that we are now seeing a very positive view of New Zealand reported in the Australian media. And sometimes, I must say, as someone who still reads both um, newspapers from New Zealand and Australia, the narrative seems to be quite different in New Zealand. So I compare in the paper commentary after John Key's re-election this year and you read the Australian press and you get the impression that this is a reformist prime minister with a very ambitious reform agenda. Um, Peter Hatcher and the Sydney Morning Herald actually called him a neoliberal activist. Um, I'm looking at the New Zealand High Commissioner. I think nobody in New Zealand would call John Key a neoliberal activist. Uh, that is a very alien way of putting it for New Zealanders. And the starting point of the publication was really then to figure out who's right. Are the Australian commentators right who believe that John Key is uh, the most reformist um, Prime Minister New Zealand has seen in at least a generation? Or are some New Zealand commentators right who complain that he is a ditherer, someone who really um, doesn't have any vision and really procrastinates his way to reform? And I think in this case, I actually side with the Australian commentators because I think they've got it right. Why do the Australian commentators have it right on John Key? Because I think the way John Key goes about his reform business requires you to step back a little bit and look at the broader picture. It doesn't quite occur to you when you're too closely linked and too closely involved because sometimes the reforms in New Zealand happen at a snail's pace. But it is a strategy that I describe as incremental radicalism we are observing. And I think the analogy with the picture that you sometimes see more clearly when you step a little bit back <coughs> and then you see the patterns, whereas if you really too closely looking at you, if you're standing right in front of the picture, you wouldn't quite get it. So what we're seeing in New Zealand is profound change. We are seeing profound change in a number of areas. We saw radical tax changes, a cut in the income tax to just 33% top rate, which compares effectively to, what is it now in Australia, 48, 49% once you include all the different levies. So it is a much more lower tax country nowadays. We compensated for part of that with an increase in GST to 15%. We had substantial changes in New Zealand in the field of welfare. Welfare policy changed substantially under the leadership of uh, the Honourable Paula Bennett. It was a long process, prepared well with a welfare reform working group and then executed in John Key's second term. We also witnessed that we have extremely good fiscal management and I think Bill English is doing an exemplary job as Minister of Finance and Deputy Prime Minister with a, with a real focus on bringing the budget back to surplus. And if you just <clears throat> take into consideration that New Zealand didn't write on the back of a mining boom. 
that on top of that it had to deal with um, the substantial devastation left behind by the Canterbury earthquakes. It is quite a remarkable achievement that um, Bill English is looking likely to return the budget to surplus next year already. In the book I'm trying to then identify how the key government goes about its business and what are the uh, leading characteristics of the reform approach and, um, chosen by John Key. And I identify four Ps. So I think I might add maybe another couple of that um, on a um, uh, second consideration. But let me just talk you through the four Ps that are in the book. The first P that you notice with John Key is preparation. There is a lot of time spent preparing all the public policy reforms that I just talked about. The welfare reforms took a full first term just to agree on what was needed to be done and then another term to implement the changes. With this first P, preparation, comes the second P, and that's patience. Not everything needs to be done at once. If I had one criticism for your government, it was that you were perhaps too ambitious to do everything in just one budget. And sometimes that's asking too much of the population who you would like to take on your journey. And Key is a master in doing just that. So he is establishing his case for reform. He's taking the population with him. And nothing ever hits the public by surprise. Everything is well prepared, maybe with the exception of um, Hickey Apparatus' uh, in, uh, initiative on class sizes. I see a smile on your face. <clears throat> but that is really the exception to the rule. The third P <clears throat> that Key demonstrates is pragmatism. He is not afraid of second best solutions if that's what he can get. Um, he wouldn't stop any meaningful reform process because he can't get his first best solution. He will implement the second best solution and keep working on improving that. So far, with the three Ps of patience and preparation and pragmatism, I could have also described Angela Merkel. But there is a fourth P that really differentiates John Key, and that's principles. <coughs> because I think if you are only a pragmatist, um, you are pretty good at probably managing the day-to-day -day business of the government, but you have no idea where you're leading it. There's a wonderful mm -hmm. saying about Angela Merkel, uh, actually it was a social democrat who said it, that Angela Merkel is a wonderful pilot and he would have no hesitation boarding a plane piloted by Angela Merkel, except you shouldn't care where you land. <laughs> With John Key, it's the opposite. With John Key, you know exactly where you're going because his instincts are all in favor of economic reform, economic liberalism. This is where he wants to take his country. So you take these four Ps of preparation, principles, pragmatism, and patience, and you've got Key's um, recipe for success. And the other two Ps I might add now, which I probably should have put in as well, is passion, because he is someone who is passionate about New Zealand, passionate about making this country a great success, making it the best little country in the world. And performance, because Key is someone who really runs New Zealand as a small country, but rather like a big corporation. The world that Key knows um, best, of course, from his days at Merrill Lynch. So had Key not chosen his vocation as a politician and taken this job as prime minister, he probably would have been uh, an investment bank CEO by now. And this is exactly how he leads his cabinet. So for the ministers who perform really well, they get little guidance and Key lets them do their jobs. For the ministers who take a little bit more guidance, they get it. For the ministers who probably take too much guidance, they are out. Key can be a ruthless operator and a ruthless manager of his cabinet. I think once you take all of this together, the six piece by now, I'm still struggling to find more. I think you get a good picture of who this John Key really is and how he leads his country. He does it very successfully. It is benefiting him personally. His approval ratings are phenomenal for a politician after six years in office. It works really well for his party that came just one seat short of reaching an absolute majority, which is unheard of really un under um, New Zealand's stupid electoral system of MMP, which mm -hmm. was imported from Germany. And it is actually working well for New Zealand because you can see that the growth figures for New Zealand in the last three years were actually slightly stronger than Australia's. New Zealand has overtaken Australia in competitiveness terms. It's now ranked 17th on the Global Competitiveness Index. Most no said in New Zealand. But MMP. <laughs> we have all the complications that you have in the Senate um, in our lower house. Um, if you want to swap, I think I would take your bicameralism and uh, give up MMP instead. But... Um, there are some structural differences, of course, which we shouldn't deny, which probably make reform a little bit easier at times for a New Zealand Prime Minister. But nevertheless, I think this should not diminish Key's great achievement. He's a great leader. He is a great Prime Minister. He's leading New Zealand onto the right path. And I hope that by emulating his success and by learning the lessons from New Zealand's um, success story, 
Australia can get back on track and make it a great reform success story that I so admired when I first lived here. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much, Oliver. The one P you didn't mention, of course, is Palmer. I think that's what, <laughs> the P that we have that you don't. Um, but, but thank you, Oliver. The, the books are here for you to collect. I can just give you a, 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 just a taste. I can't reveal who the author of the second uh, Menzies essay will be, but I can tell you it, it'll be a, a very well-known uh, figure uh, and it'll be a very substantial uh, second essay and that'll come out early next year. Uh, as soon as I have, have, uh, have it in the bag, as soon as I have the manuscript, I shall reveal all. Uh, but thank you very much. If you want to add your name to our mailing list, there's a slip in the book that you can give to us. Uh, and Oliver, I'd just like to present you, before you leave these shores, with the book of the year, uh, signed by the author. <laughs> thank you.